time I was three or four years old, I drew all the time. Drew, drew, draw, do all the time, every second. I, when I worked in my when I worked in my father's florist too. He was a from the old country, uh, and he was a Greek immigrant along with my mother. Uh, but when I worked in a and I worked at a store as a, a good uh, Greek uh, son always did. Um, I drew all the time, and when I was in the store, and I wasn't actually working, I was drawing, 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 drawing. Yeah, I was at uh, the High School of Music and Art. Um, and I call it the greatest school of learning since uh, Alexander sat at the feet of uh, Aristotle. Uh, but uh, uh, I took design courses among, uh, you know, along with history of art courses, and along with academic courses, and um, uh, I. I had a flair for it, whatever that means. But the, 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 at the very beginning uh, the, the, of the design courses, they were uh, basically, uh, um, you know, kind of a, a retro, uh, uh, you know, Kandinsky's and uh, Herbert uh, and Herbert Matters and uh, Paul Clay's, and we did designs with circles, and then we did a design with circles and uh, triangles, and then with uh, circles, triangles, and squares, etc., rectangles. Et and um, at the end of my very first term, uh, after doing that for a term, you know, along with all my other courses, uh, he, uh, uh, Mr. Patterson gave us an eight, a beautiful 18 by 24 sheet of Strathmore, uh, expensive sheet of Strathmore, must have cost at least a quarter in those days, which was big bucks. And uh, he said, um, uh, what we're going to do in the next hour and a half uh, will be uh, uh, one half of your mark for the term. Uh, you know, we had done dozens and dozens of them. And he said, um, and the, the, the subject this time is rectangles, period. And everybody started to work. And I just sat there for an hour and a half and I didn't move. Just kind of looked around the room and he, was furious, you know. You could see him walking around and trying to. Everybody busy as hell, cutting out squares and, you know, and doing a shape here, doing doing Malevich's, you know, you know Malevich red shaped, red, red, blue shape. And I didn't move. And uh, and an hour and a half later, he said, the "Time's up." And he, he started to pick up his. He was furious. He was turning red, and he came up to me, to me, and he and he went to grab my eighteen by twenty four sheet, and I said, "Hold it a minute, Mr. Patterson," and I wrote my, my name, my signature in the corner, and I handed him a 18 by 24 rectangle. And he still didn't get it, he was furious. And he tore it out, and I walked, I said, oh my God, I, he didn't get it, I, oh boy. And I came in the next morning, and there, there were two or three teachers in the hallway who stopped me, and they said, George, what you did for Mr. Patterson's class was brilliant. So he obviously had gone into, uh, the locker room or something, and as, as they were leaving school, and he said, yeah, "What's wrong with that George Lois here? He's a terrific student." And he said, uh, yeah, "He was doing do an 18 by 20. Yeah, he, really did. And he, he did nothing. He just handed me an 18 by 24 rectangle." Uh, anyway, th that was kind of a. I've always said that was kind of a, my epiphany, my self-induced in, epiphany when I when I realized that, uh, and and I made the, uh, public to. Everybody at the high school of music and art that uh, any that any problem, any design problem, any communication problem, there's, there's a chance to do something unusual, exciting, dramatic, unique, um, and um, and I and my my whole career is based on the fact that everything I work on, what I have to Create whether it's a advertisement or a, you know a, a, you know a a, a a music video, a magazine cover, a promotion piece uh, that the that the my answer has got to be totally surprising and unique and almost and thrilling. Um, uh, so somehow in that first year at. at um, at the high school in music, music and art, I knew I was going to be some kind of a uh, a communicator, a designer, a, uh, and and also uh, I, I was really uh, inspired greatly by uh, uh, the work of Paul Rand, who at that time uh, 
uh, that was 45 and I was 14 years old and he must have been like 26 or something. He was a wonder king uh, and he uh, was he was uh, writing and creating his own advertising for people, for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, clients like Orbax and he was doing um, IBM logos, etc. And um, he, it was thrilling to look at his work, not that my work is anything near what his is, but um, I, uh, I was thrilled with the idea that, a, uh, that you could work in, uh, as a communicator, as a designer, as an advertising guy, um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and create your own work and, uh, and not be a whore, not, and not do uh, uh, you know, awful, uh, terrible work. So that, that inspired Well, uh, I started in advertising, I, after the High School of Music and Art, uh, that was all. That was basically my uh, my graphic arts training, as far as I'm concerned. It was, in, you know, it was four incredible years. Uh, I then uh, uh, went to uh, Pratt Institute, and I uh, and it. Uh, I met my uh, future wife that first day of school, and I, w I was nuts about her. And um, I realized after one or two, after a week of Pratt, that they weren't anywhere near as good as the high school music and art. But I stuck it out because I went. I wasn't about to leave her, and. Um, I went through the first year, and then the second year, I, I, you know, I didn't quite what I, I, I didn't quite know what to do, and I because I know the school was so awful, and um, but I went to my first classes at the second year, and I had a, again I ran into another great mentor, a man, by, a teacher by the name of Her Herschel Levitt, and he looked at my and he was he saw what I did for him, and he said, uh, George, why are you in, why are you in school? And I said, I'm trying to make a living, you know. I, and he said, get out of here, you're not going to learn any more here. And he gave me a, a piece of paper with a woman's name who had a, 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 a woman art director, which was very unique back then, who had an art studio. And she sent me to him the next, and I went there the next morning, and I, and I left school in the, my second, in, in, before my, actually my first, second year started. Um, uh, so and, and she did promotion and advertising, etc. It was a great, great first job because she was a, a superb designer, etc. Et what happened was I lost my exemption uh, uh, for, uh, in the army. It was during the Korean War, and I got drafted and uh, wound up going to Korea. Came back alive, and um, uh, she wanted me to be a partner with her. But, uh, I didn't want to, and she said, what do you want to do? I really want to work at CBS television, because it was a, a really dynamic time with, uh, in corporate uh, imagery and corporate design with uh, the great Bill Golden at the head of it. He had just, they had just done the CBSI, et cetera. So I went into at CBS, and it was an incredible atelier of design and advertising. But somehow it wasn't a big, it wasn't, Big time advertising, you know, you know we worked on products, etc. And from there, so I left there, you know, and, and Bill Golden said to me in six, in '53 or four, whatever it was, '54, uh, George, you you can't go out there. It's a world. The, the, the world is terrible. They're all Philistines. They're all hacks. And he was right, you know. Um, he said, you, you're not going to be happy there. They're not going to appreciate your talent. And, and I said, well, I, I, well, somehow something drove me to, to do it. And, uh, you know, I, I went for, and I went and I had, the, I had the job I went to was pretty awful. Uh, and I had a lot of, uh, a lot of stories uh, which that seemingly apocryphal, but actually true when I kind of uh, acted up in my first agency and uh, overturned the desk, et cetera. Did, some kind of crazy stuff, but uh, after that, I uh, I went uh, and I worked with some of the great uh, 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 other great pioneers in advertising uh, in, and and des and uh, an advertising designer Herb Blue Ballin and I worked uh, then I went to Doyle Van Burnback and worked with uh, for Bill Burnback and uh, and Bob Gage, and and um, and at so and and again I did something insane. Uh, uh, I left Doyle Vane Burr. I went to Bill Burback and I told him I was leaving to start the second creative agency in the world. Because Bill Burback had started the, the only creative agency in the world. The reason he started it, reason, it was based on the fact that he had worked with Paul Rand early in his career. And somehow he understood that if you worked with a good, terrific graphic designer 
especially a, a one who was prolific and could write like, like Paul ran, that you could do better advertising if you worked, if, if, the, if the art director could work, could conceive advertising with the writer. Because up to that time, basically all advertising was, uh, uh, the art director sat in his room with a th his thumb up his ass and waited for the uh, creative director, to, for the art, for the uh, copywriter to come in, and throw him a piece of paper and say, "Make a layout, you know, lay this out." And the layouts were, you know, these typical awful, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, unambitious uh, layouts. So uh, I left Oil Day and Burbank. When I left Oil Day and Burbank, Bill Burbank said to me, "George, you don't know what's out there," <laughs> uh, you know. Uh, 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 the um, uh, you know they, 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 they could, and, he, and he literally said that Doyle Dan Burbank was was basically a creative freak that, that, that somehow they were a miraculous uh, a group of people that somehow together could forge a, a great advertising and it couldn't happen again uh, not in the not in this Philistine world but I started an agency called Pepper Kane Lois with the, with two writers actually and. Um, and we were successful almost immediately, almost immediately. And and then after a couple, a few, uh, one or two, three years, uh, coming out of our, my agency were two other agencies, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, Carl Alley and a guy named Cape Sloves, and then another guy left my agency and started went into business with Mary Wells and started Mary, uh, you know, Wells Rich Green. And before you knew it, by the mid, by the mid. Uh, um, uh, 60s, uh, uh, you know, I, I realized that I had triggered, with, the, with starting that second creative agency, I had triggered something called the creative revolution in advertising. And, um, and, uh, and, and it, it, it became the, uh, the uh, golden age of, uh, of, of, of advertising. I mean, six, the 60s and uh, the 70s basically was the golden age of advertising, in, in, uh, in advertising. This is Mad Men, uh, you know, uh, think I hate their show, which is true. Um, uh, you know, when I first started the show, uh, before it premiered, uh, I get a call from one of the producers and he said, uh, you know, we're looking, we're, we're shooting, uh, we're doing little spots with the people who were the original Mad Men, he said, of the period. And, you know, we're shooting and they named four or five or six people and I didn't even, never heard of a couple of them. And, um, uh, and whoever, whoever we talk to uh, mentions your name. I said, time out. You're doing a show on the advertising in the 60s, you never heard my name. He said, oh, no, no we've heard your name. I said, bullshit, you never heard my name. Okay. I said, if you want to know what happened in the 60s, if you want a real understanding of what happened in the 60s, I did a book in 1972 called George Be Careful, which is basically uh, you know, my story about, uh, you know, uh, growing up in, uh, in, in New York and, you know, growing up as a, in the New York School of, of Design. I became one of the Wonder Kings of the New York School of Design and how I started, you know, uh, uh, you know the second creative agency in the world and how, how that became the creative, blah, blah, blah. It's all about the 60s, et cetera. And, um, and I called it George Be Careful because when I was a kid, uh, you know, I remember the hand of God coming into my into my bedroom, you know, it was Michelangelo's hand. It said, George, be careful. And my mother, my mother told me, to, George, all my life, my mother told me, to, George, be careful. My father, my sisters, uh, my coaches in sports, my, uh, uh, you know, my, uh, when I went into the army, they told me to be careful. And then, 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 when you go into advertising, that's when everybody tells you to, to be careful, you know. Anything, anything unusual, anything over the top, anything edgy, you, you can't do that. And so, so George, be careful, was my anti-slogan. And if you wanted to know anything about uh, the six, uh, advertising in the 60s and the advertising world in the 60s, read that book, Goodbye. You know, and I, you know, I would say, fuck you, and I quoted it. And he called me back a couple of days later. Somehow, he, and I told him to go to get the book on Amazon because it was out of. Print. He called me up a couple of days later and he said, "Oh Jesus, wow, we could have done a show on that." I said, "No shit, you know, because because that was the the '60s. Anybody who knows anything about the media world, any anything knows anything about it. When you mention the '60s and you mention advertising in the '60s, they don't think 
Now they think of the Mad Men of that dumb show. Before that, they thought of it, of it as a heroic age of really uh, of, of of the age that I was talking to you about about drinking, uh, you know, uh, you know. Uh, leaving Doyle Dane, Burnback, and, and, and Burnback was a giant part of it, obviously. And then with another three or four agency that, after, that kind of came out of my agency, that was the, the most heroic age in media communications since uh, the, uh, the, 12, the 12 Apostles. Well, um, the, you know, to, to oversimplify, the big idea is to, is the, uh, is the, is the, is, um, is um, a, a concept that 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 takes the unique selling the unique virtues of a product and and sieving it into somebody's into people's minds uh, that somehow forces a a a, a, a extraordinary uh, sales increase in whatever you're talking about. Uh, but, you know, and I always talk about the big idea. I'm kind of called the Mr. Mr. Big Idea. Um, you know, but what I'm really talking about is, uh, is true creativity. And I, and I say creativity, you know, can solve almost any problem. You know, the, uh, you know, the creative act, you know, the freedom of habit by originality can overcome everything. But at the same time that I talk about the creative act, I really, I, I really tell people who are, who are trying to be do creative work? That creativity isn't really a creative act; it's an act of discovery. And they look at you like, "Huh?" You know. Um, and I, I did a book called um, George Lois on his creation of the big idea. You know, where I show a hundred things I did on the right hand page and on the left hand page before it. I show something in my DNA, something in my understanding of, of uh, seven thousand years of of art, of, of uh, something in my understanding of, 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 of movies, of ballet, of, uh, of sports, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of humor, of dirty jokes, whatever it is, something in there that inspired what I did. And I tell, t and I tell young people especially, um, you know, uh, uh, that, that background that, uh, that, uh, of, of high art and pop art, that, that intellectual background of understanding the world around you, and 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 and, and especially, uh, you know, the, the seven thousand years of art, is 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 uh, is, is is essential to doing creative work. That some that and that once once you are, you are, you have that that understanding, you know, and and, and that that ethos of 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 of, of, under, of, of trying to understand everything. When you have any kind of a problem, if you then look at the problem and look at the competitor and et cetera, and look at it and get your basic information, once you really understand the problem, the answer is the answer is there. It's like floating by, and all you got to do is grab it. It really isn't an act of creativity; it's an act of discovery. I I I, I sound very mystical talking about it, but I, I absolutely. It's, that's absolutely what creativity is to me. If I learn all that there is to learn, learn about something, and I know I'm ready to, um, to to come up with an answer, it's there. And it's not a bolt of lightning. What it is, it's coming out of your own uh, out of your own sensibilities and own understanding of the world. The method is uh, is to be interested in everything. And the and the organic part of it is uh, the uh, the passion for for everything around you, the passion for you know. I mean, I, I you know I when I when I teach a class you know at School of Visual Arts as a favor to somebody, and I'll I'll say to a class of you know, twenty five kids, uh, when's the um, uh, when's the, uh, have any of you been to the museum Metropolitan Museum of Art this year? Okay. Have any of you been to to MoMA this year? One hand. Uh, if has anybody have, have have any of you never been to the museum of Mountain Art? You know, five people, eight people. You know, I I'm astounded. You know, I'm just truly astounded. You know, I'm talking to design students and people uh, who are supposed to be communicators. You know, you don't. You know, uh, um, so you know that total. Uh, 
and that's why when people say today, well, how is it? When's the second? Is the, is the second credit revolution, revolution going to come? I said no. I said I mean you got you got the you got the internet and you got Google. You got all the information at your fingertips, and no and nobody they don't know shit. Nobody knows shit. You know. One of the classic books in advertising. One of the great books in advertising. The Confessions of an Ad Man, uh, you know, by uh, by uh, uh, David Ogilvy. Uh, every word in there is the wrong, it, it, absolutely wrong. Every, every wrong. In uh, when I was working at Doyle Dane Burn back in 1959, I got conned uh, uh, by his uh, copy chief into coming to see Ogilvy, and I, you know, I said, I said, well, you, you talked to the wrong guy. I mean, uh, uh, and they and they he begged me to come, and I went. And um, Ogilvy's trying to hire me as their head art director. You know, I think at one point I said I'd be the head art director if, if I could become the, co the creative creative chief. He was the creative chief. You know, if, if I was the creative chief, I could I could do great advertising here. You know, but and I told him, I, uh, 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 Mr. Ogilvy, I don't know why you're trying to hire me because I don't understand one word. In, I, I don't believe I don't I don't agree with one word in your book. Uh, I mean, he had you know he had the rules of this, and you got the logo's got to be here, and he's got I mean, he's got r rules. There are no rules in advertising. It's imp it's impossible, you know. I mean, the only rule in advertising is that there are no rules, you know. The best, uh, what I'm saying to you now. Huh? Look at the newsstand, you know. I mean, it's a cacophony of uh, of uh, of. of uh, Famous people or people who want to be famous with blurbs all around it, and it's, and it's supposed to be, and uh, you know, it's, that's supposed to be creativity in uh, in journalism. My God, it's it's unbelievable. It's shocking. I mean, how can how can two hundred magazines, you know, do the same cover? You know, um, uh, that's that's always there. And advertise. You go home and watch advertise. I you you watch advertise commercials on TV, and I don't. I really. I I'm not kidding. I don't. I don't really understand what, what the hell. I mean, half of them. I don't understand what they're talking about, you know. And and most people don't understand. Even if they see something that they kind of enjoy, they don't remember the name of the product, you know. So I mean, I think uh, I, I don't I don't see any. I mean, these people to keep talking about the, the, we're on the advent of coming up with a, the creative evolution. I don't see it, you know. I don't. At the same time, I know there's got to be talent out there. I don't. I'm not sure who's who's telling them what to do. You, you, you have to have an understanding. You have to understand. Have an understanding. That everything. I go back to what I said before. Everything you do, you have to have a solid problem. If you come up with an idea, a big idea, if you if you show it to, to somebody, your wife, your friend, or, or a client, they should go, "Holy shit." They should, your head coach should go back a foot, you know. It should be such, it should be such, an, such a surprising idea. The only chance you have to do anything that's memorable is it has to be a shock when you first see it, you know. And what people do is they, 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 they just, so the, so the work is so unambitious, you know. Uh, I mean, television commercials are little films. You know, something's going on, and you don't quite know what's going on, and you say, "Well, what is it about?" And then you're looking for the, who the client is, and then when you see it, you say, "Oh, I don't get it." You know, um, so I, I, I find it uh, it's a it's a it's a wasteland of uh, creativity, unfortunately. And I can't believe there isn't talent out there because I, you know, I I, I pay people uh, I have fans who profess you know, a, a love of my work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's got to be something they got to learn from it. And what they got to be learning from it is that when you do something, it should be a, it should be a knockout idea, you know? And, and in most cases, certainly in, um, certainly in, in editorial, and in, 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 which I only did for 10 years for, for Esquire and I, and, uh, you know, and then now in the Museum of Modern Art, but, but, uh, but you have to, you know, when you every cover is when it hit, when it was on a newsstand, people, some people went, I mean, the, the, the culture went apeshit on on some of them. They looked at it and went, whoa. Um, um, you know, go to a newsstand today. 
there's, there's not a memorable, forget about something being culturally, uh, being a culture buster, there's nothing there that you could possibly remember. There's an ad today, about, a Hearst ad today, but with three magazines, they talk about they're getting awards, et cetera, et cetera, and you look at the covers and, uh, I don't know, they're nothing, you know, they're all the same cover, you know. Oh, no, that's the that's the big problem, you know. I mean, I'm talking about people about uh, young designers not not being ambitious enough, et cetera, et cetera. One of the problems is uh, is that uh, you know certainly in uh, in magazine design, there's a lot of terrific talent uh, doing editorial. I mean, when you get this a society publication designer sends me a, their awards every year, a book, you know, and. You, and uh, and you look through it, and there's a lot of terrific spreads in it, and a lot of exciting stuff going on. You know there's talent there, and then they show the best covers of the year, and they're, and they're, and they're, they're nothing, you know. Everything. It was the editor. Uh, you know, Carol Hayes came to me. Uh, he had just basically taken over the editorship of the magazine, even though he had been responsible for the last five or six or seven issues. And uh, he, he, had, he had been reading in 1960, in 1962, about my, uh, my ad agency. And, they, and the reason it, it, it struck him was because it was an art director, who was the first ad agency, Pat McCain Lois, where there was an art director in the, in the, main, in the, in the masthead. And the stories were all about my advertising. You know, every month there was a big story in the New York Times, at least, uh, about campaigns I had done. So he was looking at, uh, at an avid art director's uh, exciting work, and something made him call me uh, to get advice on how to do covers. I had never done a cover in my life. And, and when he called me, and when I saw him, I didn't, I didn't know, I thought he was trying to get advertising for my ad agency. Uh, and I was being nice to talk to him because I, I, I had been reading the magazine, I knew it was a terrific magazine. And he, and he re basically said, uh, I need advice. How do you, and I said, well, how do you do them now? How do you do your covers now? He said, well, you know, uh, uh, five, you know, four or five of us editors sit down with uh, three or four people on the design for heart, and we have a long discussion about, and we try to come up with the, uh, the, the, the uh, what topic in the issue coming up should be the subject of a, a, co of a cover. I said, yeah. And then he said, and then we all went to go away. We come back two or three days later. We each of us uh, have one or two ideas on what the cover should be. And maybe there's five or six of, of them that we, we don't quite know. So we pick them out, we comp them up. And I, I said, oh my God, group fucking grope. And he said, huh? I said, group grope. I said, that, is that the way you work with the uh, mailer and police? And, and uh, you know, and, and uh, it, it, he said, no, of course not. I said, well, obviously you don't have anybody there who knows how to, somebody young who comes to you and says, hey, Howard, why don't we do this? So, you know, go out. Now, basically I was saying, get a freelancer. So he said, well, who, how do you, I said, well, you know, uh, you get, a, get somebody who understands the culture, uh, who's a kind of head of the culture, who, uh, who's literate, uh, who, who, who understands, who loves politics, who loves the, you know, who likes, loves the opera, and loves uh, you know, the theater music, and he, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, and he's like, he, he, he can tell a dirty joke, and he knows, blah, 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 blah. somebody who understands the culture. And, and I, and I started to give him a couple of names that meet with people who might be able to do it, and he said, and he, he was Southern, he was Southern, Southern liberal, kind of an oxymoron. And he said, uh, hey pal, can you do me just one favor? I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Can you do me one cover? And he said, okay, I'll do you one cover. Um, and uh, I said, what, when's, the, when's the next issue do? Uh, when's the next cover do? And he said, next Tuesday, but now let me give you time. I said, no, I'll, you, I'll do it for next Tuesday. What's in the issue? And he, I don't have it here. I said, describe it. Tell me, describe a sentence for each a story. So he gave, told me this, 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 this. And one of the things he mentioned was, uh, 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 there was a spread with a, a, a photo uh, and a short piece on uh, Floyd Patterson, who was a champion of the world, and, and Sonny Liston, uh, who was the challenger, and Floyd was, uh, in the upcoming fight, was a, 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 a big favorite, a big five to one favorite, too fast to, to, for listing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I said, well, so the issue is going to come out, uh, the, the issue will come out a week before the fight, 
I said, okay, I went away and I did a cover. I got a guy who looked like, a, like, like Patterson, you know, six foot, not too muscly. And I showed him and I called a fight. I basically said everybody was wrong about it. He's not going to win the fight. He's going to get, he's going to get destroyed by Liston. And I showed Patterson laying flat, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the middle of the ring, left for dead. You know, nobody, nobody in the arena. The, the, the uh, his handlers are gone. The, the, the press is gone. Twenty thousand people are gone. Uh, it was a metaphor for um, metaphor not only for sports, for boxing. You know, if you lose your if you lose, you're, you're dead, you know. And, uh, but a metaphor for uh, uh, any walk of life, you know, when you're a loser, they leave you for dead. Um, anyway, and, uh, and, uh, and, and the, the cover came, and, uh, he, and w when he, show, he called me up and he said, oh my God, I never saw a cover like this in my life. And I said, yeah, that's right. That's right. He said, but you're calling the fight. And, no shit. Uh, so, you're crazy. Suppose you're wrong. I said, I 50 50 chance I'm right. You know, and if I'm right, you're a genius. And if I'm wrong, tough, you know, hey, you know, you played the game. Uh, but I said, I'm right. You know, I really told him I am absolutely right. And anyway, he, I found out many years later, he it ran because he said he would quit if he, if uh, the publisher, you know, turned it down. Which, in fact, when the issue came out, the publisher, Arnold Gingrich, wrote a editorial saying, you see that cover? See our cover? We have nothing to do with it. You know, it, it's, it's absolutely true. Anyway, when the cover came out, when, it, when the issue came out, the, uh, every, it was a laughing stock in the sports world, and they, they were holding up, they're really ridiculous, you know. You know um, five or six days later, Liston destroyed them, and they were geniuses, and they had the, the biggest newsstand sales in their history. And I um, found out later there were guys, uh, the, the editors I met only a couple of years ago that said when, that, when the cover came out, uh, they thought it was the end of Esquire because they didn't, almost didn't expect the paycheck anyway. They were so deeply in the red, the magazine was in. I found out later that they were really in trouble uh, you know, financially. And uh, what happened from the time I started doing the covers um, to, uh, for almost 10 years, is the, uh, the uh, circulation went from 500,000 to 2 million. And, uh, you know, and, 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 and with cover after cover, uh, you know, some incredibly controversial, uh, but, you know, anti war, mass, the only mass magazine in America that, that dared speak out against the, the uh, Vietnam War. In fact, we, uh, we, we, uh, we were the leading. Uh, we were the, the leading people in the uh, media in, in, in America against the Vietnam War, and uh, and in the support of Muhammad Ali, who was a, who was a hated uh, a, a fighter at the time of uh, uh, after he became a Muslim and uh, and uh, and refused to fight in in that terrible war, you know. So um, um, uh, and and it, and it only all happened because of Hayes, because people say, boy, he took. Some balls to do those covers, Lois. I didn't take balls to do the covers. It took him balls to run it, you know. And in fact, you know, uh, you know, I'd, I'd send, I'd call him up and I'd say, uh, I'd, I'd say I was sending a cover to him, and I and I always chose my own su a topic for what he showed me. Sometimes he showed, he talked about uh, 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 what was coming up in a magazine, and I and I knew the topic that he was basically excited about was the one I. I had to do because it was that important, but m many times I I picked the uh, you know like that cover I did I, I told you about for the first issue with, with list of what it was just the spread that they put in at the last minute you know, but uh, uh, but I, I'd call them up and I'd say I said I, covers about to get to you, Harold and uh, and I said this one's going to really get us in trouble and he'd say yeah. And when I meant trouble, I meant uh, he would lose. Uh, not only would he get bombed, it was by senators and congressmen and uh, God knows who, and 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 right and people uh, uh, writing in, you know, uh, you know, death threats sometimes, uh, uh, you know, but uh, losing uh, advertising clients because he had they uh, Esquire had many clients down south. You know, uh, they did a lot of a. Uh, uh, 
you know, uh, uh, men's wear, and uh, a lot of the mills were down south. And, uh, and, it, and it was a time of the Jim Crow South. I mean, it, it was a time of real racism going on in America. There's always racism in America, but that was when it was ran uh, rabid and rampant. No, it's changed, oh, for worse, because um, um, somehow, you know, growing up with the internet and growing up on the, with stuff on the screen and, and filling, it, filling the page with information, you know, look, at, look at most magazines today, look at even the great magazines today, you know, and like a Vanity Fair. It's just jammed with, and New York, it's just jammed with information and copy, et cetera. It's almost like, you know, it's an extension of, of the TV, of, the, of what, what people were used to. I mean, I, I, you know, when you talk about white space, which was used to be a big thing in, 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 in school, in graphic art school, in, you know, where you talked about, hey, they should have white space. But they knew what they were talking about. They were talking about, gee, well, sometimes when there's an idea that, should, that, so excited, that you need the, the expanse, you need to, uh, to you know, uh, you know, the, the, the great pioneers in in advertising, in uh, editorial design in the in the twenties and thirties was uh, a guy by the name of Dr. Agar and uh, Alexei Brodovich uh, for, for Vogue magazine, and um, and uh, uh, you know, you know the, the, the Irving Penns and the Avedons and and all graphic designers learn somehow from that kind of experience of the of, of, a, of, a, of a of a spread that had some kind of vitality to it. And um, and uh, when you look at the internet, there's inf there's load of information, but there's no there's no design vitality, and there's no attempt for design vitality. I mean, even most people's websites, where you have a chance to to do something, to express something, you know. It, it, it's it's not so much you know uh, I'm not down on the iPad or whatever they do. Uh, but I'm 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 am for the magazine. I'm for the visceral uh, excitement of a, of a magazine. I mean, to this day, you know, when I get magazines, and they don't have to be even be a great magazine. You know, you turn the page, and you, you know, you you know, you, you when you lay it on your when you lay it on your knees, it's like a lap dance. You know, I mean, it's it's, it's a visceral thing. You know, and I I can't see. You know, you know. I mean, if I was a, a really young, a young man today, uh, yeah, to say, what would, what would you be doing? The website would you? Doing? I'd say, I'd be, I'd, I'd create a magazine. Yeah, I'd create a magazine. And have people say, holy shit, did you see that cover? Then nobody, like, wow, you see that thing? Nothing like it. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's, it's, a, it's a, it's a revolution in journalism. You know, the, 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 the a graphic designer. You know who who understands ideas and understands that I, that ideas are what they make that makes the world go round could change the world with a magazine if it, just one talent could do it right now and everybody would stop saying it's the death of magazines. I'm trying. I'm trying. Uh, I, now I. Uh, it, it's funny because um, people said, "Well, you know, have you ever, you know." I, I, I'm sorry, you, been a, you weren't a movie director or this or that or that. And I say, yeah, uh, what I've able to be to be to work on in uh, being a graphic designer and and being in advertising, et cetera, was I I I I, I I've done hundreds, thousands of commercials. You know, you know, music video, best music video ever done to this day, Joker Man. Kurt, Kurt Loder still says it's the best music video ever. Uh, you know, I've done, done, done you know, sales films that would knock you down. They were so exciting. Uh, you know, I, I do. I design logos. I design packages. You know, uh, uh, I, I, I design ad agency. I design space. You know, uh, you know. I mean, every part of. Um, uh, you know, I could I could be a Renaissance man in a sense, doing all of those things. And uh, uh, including um, uh, I, I, the, the, the concept for New York Magazine, actually the first design for the first logo for New York Magazine, I did as a supplement for the Herald Tribune in 1962 or three. Um, um, 
and, and in fact, Harold Hayes was at my office one day. I think it was 63, might have been 62. And uh, he saw me working on a magazine, and he said, what, what, he, he thought, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm doing the, I do the advertising for the New York Herald Tribune, and he knew that because I was doing a very exciting campaign. Who, uh, who says a newspaper has to be dull? In fact, I was producing a commercial for the Tribune every night. I would get the front page and, and write, a, 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 write a script and a shooting script in a cab and produce a commercial every night that would go on every night. You know. In any case, and, I, and I, it was a big success. And I said, well, I, I'm, I'm selling the hell out of the newspaper, a daily paper, I can't, the Sunday paper, can't do anything with it because you can't compete with the times of times of this thick and uh, so I'm uh, so I, I, I'm doing a supplement. I'm trying to get them to understand that they can do a supplement called New York. And if you did it right, you do it beautifully designed, get terrific writing, etc., etc. And it could be a combination of the of uh, I said of the uh, of the New Yorker and Q magazine. You know, telling you about specific things to do. Uh, and if you did that, you know, you could sell another 200, 300,000, 400,000 copies just because of that terrific supplement. And, uh, and Harold's looking at it. This was only, I've only been, I was only doing covers for, for half a year or so. And he said, George, if you, if I left Esquire right now and you left your agency, we should do this magazine and we should do magazines because it, it's, it's, it, it's a city magazine, he said, and we could do a city magazine for seven or eight magazines across the country. And I remember for a second saying, holy shit, that's a real big idea, that's big think. And, but of course he didn't do it, because I had an ad agency and he, and he was doing it. But uh, when you say, why didn't, why didn't I do it now? I said, well, you know, I'm, 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 it's not that I'm old and tired. Because actually, you know, I, I supposedly retired in uh, two, the year 2000. My wife says I'm not tired. I'm just, I'm not retired. I'm just tired. But I'm not because I work all the time. I work with my son Luke, and we do stuff all the time. We're doing advertising. Yeah, you know, we're working on um, a script and shooting script for a TV special, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, you know, you never can tell. I might do a magazine. I would have to do work with a a a a, a direct a uh, an editor who basically tr treated me the way Howell did and that treated me as a as a big talent. Uh, he should treat me as at least as good as he treats he treated uh, Gay Talese. You know, and that's and that's what he did with with me. He said, you know, you I deal, you know, I deal with the Talises and the and the mailers and this and the, and the, and the Loises and they do their thing. That doesn't mean he didn't edit those guys, you know, and which he absolutely did, you know, because a, you know, even a great writer needs editing. Um, but uh, uh, he didn't edit. He didn't edit or change one thing on anything I ever did. I mean, when I did something, it was like, holy shit, wow, you know, I love it, you know, or oh, wow, am I going to be in trouble, you know, and, uh, and of course, he, he loved the whole concept of being in trouble, because being in trouble meant, uh, meant that, you know, people, that he, he knew that, he knew that, he knew that a magazine had to, had to be dynamic and had to have ideas, and he also understood something that people know it if the works understands today and that is you don't write you don't write you don't create a magazine for your readers you don't do take up you don't take a poll you know like you know, like the politicians do and find out what what they're thinking and what they want what what do you mean what they what the hell, what do you mean what they want they're supposed to be above and beyond you know uh, uh, the, the culture you're supposed to be leading the culture you're supposed to be ahead of the culture you're supposed to be telling people what the hell you think is exciting and dynamic and 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 uh, and and, and, uh, and, and thought provoking and and do it and do it your way and that's the way you can create a great magazine and then if you do it the, if you do it that way with all that kind of passion and and, uh, and talent 
you'll get an audience. You know, we got our audience. And basically, uh, at, at Esquire in the 60s, the audience basically, uh, I'm not, I never found out what the real numbers were, but, the, but I think a, 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 a half of the circulation, I'm making it up, uh, was college, was college students. You know, I, I run into people all the time to this day who, uh, you know, who were, uh, you know, were in their 20s when I was doing covers in the 60s, you know, and, uh, and now they're 60, uh, 60 years old and they, boy, they know every cover. They, taught, they can tell you how, how, how covers changed their, li changed their lives. They can tell you, they can tell, people tell me where they were when they saw the, the Ali cover at St. Sebastian. They can tell, they can tell me where, when, where they were when they saw the cover. Uh, that, that's the kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, and, and uh, Harold called them uh, pictorial zolas, you know. What's funny is I said pictorial zolas to somebody a couple of months ago when they said, what's a pictorial zola? Duh. Um, you know, when I explained to Jacques Hughes, they, they still didn't get it. But in any case, you know, and, and, I, and I call myself a, 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 a cultural provocateur. And I call myself a cultural provocateur in my advertising, too. Because when you create advertising, it's not just to sell a product or a person or an idea. It, it should go beyond that. It should, touch, it should touch, sometimes very dynamically, on the, on the culture. And it, it, there's no way, you can't do great advertising unless you understand that it shouldn't, you shouldn't just be selling the product, you should be t talking about and cap encompassing the culture or where the culture should be headed. I, I talk to that, about, I, talk, I tell students that, the young people that, young people in advertising that, they don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. They don't get it until I show them examples, you know. It, it, what, so when you say what excites me most in advertising was when I took something and made it, it made it a giant part of the culture. Um, um, and uh, that's, that was the most thrilling, you know, uh, of the things I worked on. And I've done a couple of dozen like that. Um, the, 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 the Esquire covers, what I was most excited about was, um, you know, it was uh, the anti-war stuff, you know, uh, stuff that woke up Amer helped w woke to wake up America, and and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and and woke up people to the um, to the greatness of Muhammad Ali, because when I did that cover of Muhammad Ali uh, Saint Sebastian, he was he was. He was, I mean, if there was a poll on it, there's 80% of the country, white and black, were, were against him. And, um, and the, that cover in and of itself helped change uh, the, uh, America's attitude about the war and directly, directly helped change Martin Luther King from saying to all the Southern, uh, uh, you know, uh, elite, all, all his, uh, the, all the black leaders, that he would uh, keep out of talking against the, the Vietnam War because he didn't want to piss off uh, uh, Johnson because Johnson was uh, was uh, you know a, a real pioneer in, in helping uh, in, in, in helping uh, you, know, you know forge uh, you know uh, civil rights uh, you know uh, 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 laws, uh, but uh, the second he came out against defending Muhammad Ali and against the war, uh, he was in deep shit with, with, with Johnson. Um, so, I mean, uh, I, I think uh, I'm proud of a lot of things I've done um, that helped uh, change the culture. You know, I mean, that's the stuff that, that you really remember. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I say that I, I would do a magazine, you know, but I probably would uh, start an ad agency and, and show everybody how it's done, you know. Uh, you know, I, I, there's a, there was an article I just read the other day. I, it, it, uh, what's funny is you, you, you read 30 magazines, you can't remember where you read it, you know. You know, in the old days, if you read something, Esquire, what an Esquire, one of my covers, you remember where you saw it, but that's beside the point. Uh, but uh, uh, there was an article uh, that the, the head of uh, the third largest uh, 
if you just seen the world publicis, I guess, you know, Maurice Levy. And he goes, questions and answers, it goes on and on and on. All he talks about is technology. I mean, he has not one fucking word talking about his ad agency that mentions creativity. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's got nothing to do, the product's got nothing to do with what they do, you know, what, what they're about. It's, sh it's shocking, you know. Uh, that's the way it used to be with all the ad agency. I remember there were agencies like o Ogilvy uh, 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 made it in, uh, you know, after David Ogilvy died and they, and they would, they, they talked about him. And the, the reason they, they, they sold their, themselves on the fact that they were a scientific agency in a sense that they did this great research, you know, and, and, and little, and I tell everybody, you know, advertising isn't a, a science, it's an art. I mean, science, science. Um, and, 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 you know, most, most, uh, most advertising, most people in, uh, to this day, most people in, uh, who judge advertising in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the world, uh, in, certainly in America, uh, they've all gone to you know marketing schools and communication schools, and um, when they and they've been taught or th that advertising and marketing is a science. Because how do you teach it? it's an art? You know, I mean, what would these schools say? What advertising and marketing is an art? How do you teach that? You know, um, so uh, so uh, to this day, the, the way you, you show a, a client's. Uh, you know, most clients are something and just and, and something really edgy, and, uh, and they'll look at it and they'll say, "Very interesting." And they'll, pay, they'll hand it to somebody who's sitting next to them, to the senior VP, and say, to, uh, "Very interesting. Uh, you know, uh, research it and find out if, find out if I like it." You know, um, um, you know, there's there's no there's, there's no it, people don't talk about the creativity of something. You know. Uh, uh, it, it's astounding in, in all walks of life, you know. I mean, starting with the, the, the head of a, one of these giant ad agencies, you know. But I was talking about Ogilvy made it. And that, 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 I remember the, the woman was the head of the agency, and she went on and on and on and on and on about the, 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 uh, the, the way they research, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's about time. Blah, 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 blah. Not one mention of creativity. I mean, and, and, and people like Will Burnback, when he did Dog Dan Burnback, and people like me with Papa King Lois, and uh, you know, uh, Mary Wells at Wells Rich Green, you know, that, that's all we talked about was creativity. What the fuck else is there to talk about? That's the name of the game, it's the product, you know? It's when you, when you talk to a guy who, who, who uh, uh, you know, to, to Malali at the Ford, he talks about the car, about the, car, about the product, you know?